indeed, I'm delighted to uh, open the first afternoon session, and I'm even more delighted to get help by Bonnie Taub, who is joining us from our, as the UC uh, students would say, a rival university uh, uh, in LA, UCLA. So I'm very grateful that she um, uh, accepted our invitation to chair this panel, and I hand over to her, and she can tell you uh, some words about herself. Thank you very much, uh, Wolf. Thank you very much to uh, USC, the Shoah Foundation, and um, everyone here uh, for inviting me from across the city. At least we're not playing football today, so we're okay, right? <laughs> uh, so it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I am the chair of the Latin American Studies Master's Program at UCLA. I'm the Associate Director of the Latin American Institute. And uh, for years, my colleagues uh, there have, of course, collaborated with USC uh, scholars, and we hope to continue that in the future. I'm a medical anthropologist by training, and um, also uh, have a master's in public health, um, and so I uh, wear all those hats. I'm a professor in Latin American studies, public health, and anthropology, and have uh, done research on health issues, human rights, and um, uh, traditional medicine and westernized care uh, in indigenous populations in Mexico and uh, Guatemala and also uh, worked on issues in the southern cone in Uruguay. So it's my great pleasure to be here. We have two wonderful um, papers today uh, as part of the panel Repression and Resistance. And before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to give you just about a 20-second um, uh, little story that, um, that comes to mind as I was arriving here and thinking about the most important topic of uh, this uh, symposium. It reminded me of the first time I went to Guatemala in 1987, and I was by Lake Amatitlan, and I went to uh, the lakeside with a team of um, public health and nutrition researchers and local promotoras to try and get the women who were washing the hair of their children in the lake to participate in um, our project. And we arrived at that lakeside and the women were washing their hair it was, uh, um, and they immediately took off running. The minute they heard that we were with UNICEF and foster uh, parents plan international and we couldn't understand it. So the local Guatemalans that we were working with went and talked with them and they said it was because the last time that people from the outside had come, all their men had disappeared in the village and were taken into the forest and some of their children's organs had been taken. So it was a very um, eye-opening experience to realize we were there as do-gooders, as researchers, as public health people, and we were fully aware of the history, but uh, we, were, we came face to face with it. And um, uh, so we also, uh, I came to think that um, Small acts of, of resistance in the face of repression happen every day. So it's my great pleasure today uh, to chair this panel with uh, Betsy Conifal and Sandra gruner Um Betsy will speak first, and I want to just give a couple of words of introduction. Um, uh, she is uh, part of the faculty at the College of William and Mary in Latin American Studies. Uh, she's Associate Professor of History, and she specializes in modern Latin America. Her research interests include race and ethnicity, indigenous organizing, human rights, and oppositional politics. She received a PhD in Latin American history from the University of Pittsburgh in 2005, and she has an MA in International Affairs from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Um, that she received. She has um, a couple of very important publications, one including For Every Indio Who Falls, A History of Maya Activism from 1960 to 1990, um, as well as other papers including Subvert Subverting Authenticity, Reinas Indígenas and the Guatemalan State. She also uh, was a Fulbright Scholar in 2012 uh, in Ecuador and is working on a very interesting comparative study currently on liberation theology and indigenous organizing in Guatemala, Ecuador, and Mexico. So let's welcome Betsy Conifal. Bienvenidas. Hi, thank 
you so much, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, I've been told there's a refreshing happening of the coffee and water and things at 2. So I will try to coincide with the uh, wrap up at that time. Um, I wanted to talk today about uh, genocide's connection to the past in Guatemala and its connection to possibilities in the present. to pinpoint areas that were quote-unquote historically rebellious and therefore, by the Army's reasoning, natural support bases for the insurgency. So as, Guad as geographers Liz Oglesby and Amy Ross have put it, the Army was not simply killing Mayans, it was killing Mayans in particular places where social organizing was most intense. This is a finding that got buried somewhat because of an unfortunate assumption that sometimes accompanies determinations of genocide. In the aftermath of extreme violence in Guatemala, and very unsettled, unstable peace, genocide in the public imagination seemed to require an apolitical victim. Most of us probably remember the statement by Otilia Bush, which we have here when the CEH findings were announced. In the name of the Maya living and dead, Lush argued, we ask the God of gods and all Guatemalans to pardon us because we became involved in an armed conflict that was imposed on us and that was... me as a historian, because it happened to be exactly what Lush was strategically covering over with these words that I was studying, of course. <laughs> the development of local and regional organizing among young Maya community leaders in the 1970s and 80s, some of which, of course, was connected to the armed conflict. It wasn't all connected to the armed conflict, but some of it was. This is not to suggest that all Mayas, or even a majority of Mayas, were part of Hiram mobilization, but many were. I've explored the ways in which people took part in a wide range of organizing, liberation theology, literacy, campesino organizing, revolutionary movements, even indigenous queen pageants, and talked about ideas of race and justice broadly understood since the mid 1970s. So this is the subject of my first and so far only book uh, for every India who falls which we have here, a shameless book. <laughs> so if you trace over time, um, you see that activist Mayas from at least the early 1970s focused on shared experiences of racism and discrimination, sometimes within or alongside multi-ethnic mobilization. As state violence against organizing grew from the mid-1970s, many came to perceive state repression of their efforts as ethnically based, at least in part. With the ratcheting up of mass violence with Pansos in 1978, Mayas immediately used the terms ethnocide and genocide in, condemn in condemning official murder. In other words, even before the numbers of dead climbed so horrifically in the early 1980s, activist Mayas viewed counterinsurgency violence as directed against themselves as community leaders and as Mayas. They had learned from struggles that came before them, especially in the 1944 to 54 period, and its aftermath. By the late 1970s, they perceived the state, especially with the president that they termed the assassin, Lucas Garcia, to be waging a genocidal war against the Pueblo Maya at large. So perceptions of genocide on the part of activist Mayas 
and resistance to state violence on those grounds were widely shared already by 1978 and predate the CEH by decades. So building from this, I've been exploring two related subjects important to the study of Guatemalan state violence and resistance to it. First, as the state pushed back against organizing in the 70s, what can we know about intent in Maya communities? When do we see the state expressing concern about Maya organizing specifically? And how did reactions to Highland activism state preoccupations with Maya mobilization in its earliest forms, in literacy campaigns, in liberation theology, cooperatives, right, to later patterns of more widespread violence and terror against my communities or specific acts of genocide. Second, what kind of state actions led organized Mayas to understand that they, as an ethnic or racialized group, were under attack? How do these perceptions lead to growing and specific forms of resistance to counterinsurgency terror? So when I began researching on the 1970s activism, uh, this was about in 2001, 2002, my attention was on Maya's both in racially focused and class-based organizing, the networks they built, uh, their own personal histories of mobilization. At the time, I could only wonder how ethnicity shaped practices of repression or official strategies relating to Mayas. But now, with internal security documents becoming available at the National Police Archive, for example, we can have a look. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, I have to say it was surreal going to the National Police Archive for the first time. If you haven't done it, you must. Um, and, and simply entering search terms into the database. I'll mention just one case here, uh, that of Emeterio Toc Medrano. Some of you might know or know of Emeterio Toc. He was from Santa Cruz, El Quiche, uh, a Quiche Maya, a catechist, a radio broadcaster, a founder of Cook, and a member of the EGP. He had a special role in the EGP to serve as something of a bridge to other Mayas in more ethnically focused opposition movements to bring them into cooperation with the EGP in 1979, 80, 81. As many of you may know, he was captured by the Guatemalan security forces in 1981. The army realized what they had, a well-known Maya organizer, and they developed a plan to use him to the fullest. After months of torture and detention, he was forced to make the rounds of indigenous communities, ordered to tell local leaders to cooperate with the army. He was made to hold a press conference. This, is, this was in the newspaper, uh, uh, his press conference, where he's sitting next to uh, the interior minister. He, had, he was forced to read a long statement where he denounced the EGP and claimed that they used Mayas as cannon fodder. He repeated the requisite stereotypes. He had been duped into cooperating with the EGP because he was an uneducated indigenous man. He and all Mayas, he said, only wanted to work dutifully and peacefully. You may know that he escaped soon after this press conference and rejoined the EGP. When the National Police Archives are consulted with, with Emeterio's name, you see very quickly that Emeterio Toc and many like him had attracted the interest of security forces already in 1973. This is prior to the founding of Kuk, prior to the EGP entering the region, prior to any insurgency in any real sense in the Highlands. Here we have a detective report from June 3rd, 1973, and it shows what kinds of things concerned the security forces at that time. Um, the, sec the section at the top. Anonymous sources indicate that on the weekends, groups of young people led by Jesuit priests, one of who I think will m join us tomorrow, <laughs> uh, go to Quiche to raise the consciousness of indigenous, posing questions such as, the Ladino isn't the same as you? Who is better and why? 
It's a detailed report on the catechist movement in 1973 in Santa Cruz. It includes a list, like countless such lists, focused on so-called communist youth working in catech catechizing projects among Mayas. It names names. The report contains 36 names in all caps. Teachers, administrators, directors of schools, literacy promoters, our intrepid radio broadcaster and material, um, the aldeas where they lived, places where they worked, the location of a finquita where people met on Saturday nights. I have to say that many times during field work, as I tried to understand activists, Maya's connections and networks from 25 years earlier, I realized how totally creepy it was <laughs> to be collecting the kind of information, doing the kind of work that I imagine the security forces doing in that earlier era. I can now see how close the parallels really were. We see in the National Police Archive that the security forces were interested in the very same people, the very same processes of Maya mobilization. Detectives took down names of people passing out kook information. They recorded, just like I did, the content of every banner in every protest. National police newspaper binders show that they collected the very same press clippings that I did, right? We both had this one, for example, um, uh, uh, showing activists Mayas captured in Santiago de Titlán, lined up for the press. Um, the entire file on Emeterio Tope turning himself in and denouncing the EGP uh, was prominently in these binders. The police documents like these are not exactly surprising. The one from 1973 confirms what organizers have long said about closing possibilities for change in the early 70s. In the files, we see security forces intent on tracking activism um, among Maya specifically, which confirms their perceptions of repression. But it is a new form of evidence and may be connected to unanswered questions about genocide. More investigations into these kinds of records as they become available would help us better track the thinking of security forces, understand their calculations as they set their counterinsurgency sites on a mobilized and confrontational Pueblo Maya. We can trace the development of genocidal thinking as the state transitioned from its age-old focus on the Maya problem to a full out and specific assault on the problem Maya. I want to wrap this up on a more positive note, <laughs> which I think would help a little bit today. Um, some thoughts on histories of activism and their resurrection. Um, my own process of reconstructing an activist Maya past in the 70s began with a photo in a newspaper that some of you may remember. It's from the front page of El Grafico, July 30, 1978. As I mentioned, the Panzas Massacre was understood by many in 1978 as the army unleashing its racially motivated wrath against Maya civilians. It was a tragedy on a scale unimaginable at the time. It wasn't the first massacre, it certainly wouldn't be the last, but it was the most public. The shock and fury felt by Mayas across the highlands help explain an impassioned response from what would seem a rather unlikely source, these young Maya women participating in local and national pageants for indigenous queen. So the young women at the center of this photo were local indigenous queens from nine different communities across the highlands, and their photo was accompanied by their biting denunciation of army violence in Pensos and a call to boycott the state-sponsored folklore festival in Coban. The queens and their supporters insisted that the state's celebration of folkloric Maya authenticity, two months after the killings in Pansos, reeked of hypocrisy. The indigenous queens believe, the press article stated, that considering the events of Pansos, in which genuine Guatemalan Indians lost their lives, this festival should be suspended. The queens declared, quote, that the recent massacre of our Indian brothers of Pansos represents the continuation of centuries of negation, exploitation, and extermination initiated by the Spanish invaders. That while the wound of Pansos still bleeds, 
their failure, the failure of the organizing committee of this show to suspend it demonstrates the degree of dis disrespect they have for the lives of us, los indios. This national level statement followed similar speeches on local contest stages. They help reveal, in gendered ways also helped construct, many layered opposition movements in the Highlands. Though these young people came from lots of different organizing efforts, they were all offended and moved to action by the racialized tenor of the killings in Panzos. By framing the massacre as a state attack on the Maya community at large, their words and actions helped to generate that community to bring it into being and consolidate Pan-Maya pan identities that link indigenous people from different language groups and regions to each other. And also to more, more sort of coordinated indigenous and multi-ethnic resist resistance to a repressive state. They insisted that authentic, quote unquote, Indians included themselves and the Kekchis gunned down in Panzos men and women who included the campesino leader Adelina Kal, uh, known as Mama Makin. In effect, they were arguing that a Maya pageant queen was no more nor no less genuine than Mama Makin and the campesinos who had stood with her for decades. They were massacred alongside her in 1978 for demanding, in the words of one pageant contest contestant, a piece of earth to live on. These histories are full of surprises, of acts we might not expect. Finally, I just want to mention some new work that seeks them out, right, by young people in Hijos, Guatemala. Uh, specifically, their campaign, hashtag, which I don't think I've ever said in public before, <laughs> hashtag, la revolución florece, the revolution flourishes or, or flowers. Resurrecting the past is not about nostalgia, they insist. It's the memory of possibility. Right above this graffiti, of course, it says, yes, there was genocide. Ehos draws on a history to upend narratives and push for a deeper and explicitly proactive reckoning with this past. One tactic is to situate the armed conflict within a much longer history of mobilization and repression. It's an engagement with history that aims to rescue and valorize earlier struggles, remember those protagonists differently, and build from what they started long ago. In 2015, Mama Makin, uh, her image appeared in one of Ijos' uh, memory offensives, as they call them, along with other leaders martyred since the 1954 coup. The revolution flourishes is a direct re uh, uh, reference, of course, to the 1944-54 to 54 October Revolution, and it focuses on many of those protagonists. But in popular memory, revolution would also, of course, refer to the armed insurgency. It's a move that ties the goals and experiences of one generation of opposition leaders to a longer and initially more successful history initiated by another. Mama Makin, in fact, was a leader uh, at the center of local activism in both of those periods, in the October Revolution, uh, or, or its aftermath, and, and the arm, armed insurgency. In response to a lack of integrity in Guatemala's mainstream political candidates, Ijos, in fact, plastered over 2015 campaigns, campaign ads on the city walls with their own posters, like this, featuring the martyred dead as candidates for the nation's highest offices. Among them, vote for Mama Makin, Minister of Sovereignty, which I think should be a new, a new office, 2016 to 2020. This year's Army Day, too, uh, was marked by a public call by Ijos to write resistance back into the historical narrative. Standing in front of the Casa de la Memoria in Guatemala City, an Ijos member declared that, quote, here we find a history that has been silenced. It is up to all of us to rebuild it. For us, rewriting history is a commitment. And we do it in the streets. We do it in the public spaces. We rewrite our history, writing in the moments of resistance, of organizing, of struggle, of solidarity between peoples over decades and decades of struggle. Our struggle is to write our own history. These efforts open up spaces that have long been off limits 
and turn them into sites where new kind of memory work happens. These memory offensives, as they're termed, simultaneously challenge oblivion. They construct new interpretations of histories of violence and resistance, and using them, map a path forward. A resurrection of histories of activism helps us understand the road to genocide, yes. But it also makes possible a future built on that past, identifying, quote, a natural support base for something different. Thanks. Thank you very much, Betsy. Uh, the panelists have decided that they would like to combine Q&A, questions and answers, at the end. So uh, we're going to proceed with our next panelist. Um, and I'd like to give a brief introduction. Uh, Sandra Gruner Domic um, is um, uh, going to present her paper. Uh, she uh, was a lecturer at California State uh, University, Long Beach, until the summer of 2013. She worked for sociology and gender studies departments at the University of Southern California from 08 to uh, 2011. And before moving to LA, she also taught anthropology and gender studies at Humboldt University, Berlin, and worked at the Berlin Institute for Comparative Research. So you can see already she uh, is multi, uh, um, has had uh, much education and also I can see from her work here today uh, is multi-talented and wears a lot of hats. So she received her PhD in 2002 at the Department for European Ethnology at Humboldt University Berlin. Her research interests are migration, gender, the process of representation and identity in transnational context and genocide. She has a number of publications which include a book on Latin American women migration to Germany and uh, she also has written about Vietnamese, Mozambican, and Cuban labor migrants in East Germany since the 1970s in the Encyclopedia of Migration in Europe since the 17th century, uh, as well as cosmopolitan sociability, locating transnational diasporic and religious networks in an ethnic and racial book series. Uh, she um, is currently working at the USC Shoah Foundation on the very project that we've been hearing about, the Guatemalan uh, project, including the collection of survivors' interviews. And she's going to be presenting her paper, Motivaciones Sociales y Personales para la Participación Femenina en Actos de Resistencia Antes, Durante y Después del Genocidio en Guatemala social and personal motivations for women's participation in acts of resistance before, during, and after the genocide in Guatemala. It's my great pleasure to present Sandra, to introduce Sandra. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, no tengo un, uh, ahora nada lindo para mostrarles, pero al final de la presentación. Um, ¿Se me escucha bien? Lo dejamos a Mamá Maquín, que está muy bien ahí. A principios de los años 80, cuando la represión política empezó a expandir en las áreas rurales eh, del el gobierno Lucas García, la conciencia y organización de grupos mayas ya había adquirido una nueva dimensión. Uh, se organizaron seminarios y encuentros uh, de la pastoral indígena y otros posteriores que dieron paso a un movimiento popular que cuestionaba las discriminaciones tanto étnicas como económicas. Las iniciativas que surgieron después del terremoto del 1976, amplían aún más estas nuevas formas de participación. Así comenta Dora Mirón en su memoria oral, ahora parte de la colección uh, del archivo de la Fundación Shoah y la FAF, um, que los sobrevivientes de los sobrevivientes guatemaltecos, que durante su primer trabajo en Comalapa, 
cuando yo estaba en, en The Christian Children Fund, pudo ver el grado de asociación y solidaridad para organizarse entre los que colaboraban con la organización Vivienda Popular para desahuciar a todas las familias de la región. En su participación con Vivienda Popular, uh, conoció a muchas personas que se convertirían luego en dirigentes conocidos a nivel nacional, entre ellas uh, Juanita Penn y Rosalina Tuyuk que a pesar, la última, uh, Rosalina, a pesar de su joven edad, participaba en campañas de alfabetización y organización comunal. La particip participación en grupos, iniciativas y organizaciones ampliaron la discusión que había ya despertado en grupos juveniles mayas años antes y ha sido también descrita en el libro de Betty Conefal. Um, estos grupos juveniles mayas años antes se habían intensificado discutiendo en temas de identidad cultural. Al mismo tiempo, dieron inicio a acciones conjuntas de dirigentes comunitarios de diferentes localidades, creando organizaciones mayas como las que se conocen, el CUC o el partidos políticos eh, como el FIN, con fines de representación. Las agrupaciones estudiantiles, catequistas, culturalistas, literarias, etc., representan nuevas formas de resistencia a la discriminación cultural y social y racial que existían. Quiero aquí presentar algunos ejemplos uh, de las experiencias y decisiones de mujeres afectadas por el genocidio usando los testimonios recolectados por la Fundación de Antropología Forense de Guatemala, FAF, en colaboración con uh, la Fundación Shoah. Así también incluyendo uh, memorias publicadas en forma de autobiografías, compilaciones de historia de vidas, testimonios y otros materiales secundarios. Si bien mi foco... Uh, mi foco de atención se presenta en especial a las actividades y decisiones de mujeres con el objetivo de entender cómo el factor de género ha influenciado en la toma de decisiones en la relación a resistir eh, opre la opresión. Esta perspectiva no es eh, desde la oposición binaria mujer-varón, sino hecha desde las relaciones eh, que constituyen estas subjetividades y determinan las dinámicas de qué es aceptable y qué no lo es para una mujer. Esto sin, de, sin, sin dejar considerar el trasfondo cultural, social y de poder a su vez. Um, también es necesario mencionar en este preámbulo que utilizaré la definición de Foucault para uh, que percibe resistencia como una reacción contra el poder, pero vale aquí también enfatizar de que también eh, que aquí entender la clase, qué clase de poder estamos tratando o nos estamos refiriendo. Si el poder es capacidad de imponer un fin deseado a través del control o influencia de otros, los subyugados, sabemos que la posición de las mujeres mayas es de una, de una subordinación racial de clase y de género, pero que varía respecto al momento y la relación en que estos factores se hallan cuando se encuentran en acción. Es decir, que las acciones de resistencia pueden ir desde simples hechos como el no mostrar conformidad con las normas, hasta transgredir desobedeciendo leyes o respondiendo con actos subversivos, desafiando distintas formas de autoridad, tradicionales, nacionales o estatales. Dentro de las diferentes definiciones uh, de resistencia hay dos oposiciones, bueno, bueno, las podemos generalizar en dos posiciones opuestas. Una que define que si se logra cambiar, uh, a de, logra cambiar a desafiar satisfactoriamente una autoridad, se debe considerar resistencia. Al contrario, otras propuestas ven todo acto de transgresión que desafíe a una autoridad puede ser considerada resistencia. Eh, el hecho de éxito de la acción única, 
eh, únicamente se, que sea un, únicamente utilizado para definir si un acto es resistencia o no, eh, pone en desventaja e ignora ciertos procesos como eh, el activismo basado en la simplicidad o los discursos invertidos o los actos semi disfrazados clandestinos debido a la extrema vigilancia, por ejemplo. A pesar de esto, cabe mencionar de que cierta magnitud de cambio es lo que realmente caracteriza el acto de resistencia y aún, aunque estos cambios eh, no sean inmediatos. Esta es la definición a la cual me quiero abocar para a continuación ir desarrollando algunos ejemplos. La represión política de los años 70 hizo que toda forma de organización fuese controlada y mayormente fueron los hombres blancos de persecución. Aunque es interesante observar que también um, la, partip eh, la partip participación en la región rural, especialmente de mujeres jóvenes, jóvenes fue blanco también de persecución. Rosalina Tuyuk, cuya entrevista ha sido grabada en, um, ha sido entre, uh, grabada en, por, la, por, por la Fundación de Antropología Forense, cuenta que tuvo que salir de Comalapa por estar en las listas uh, de represión al ser activista y catequista. Ella cuenta que de jovencita me hice catequista. Muchos me cuestionaron por qué una mujer no debería agarrar la Biblia. Esta primera forma de resistencia fue para ella una resistencia de género. Para Rosalina, pero Rosalina no fue una excepción. Um, pa, eh, Peláez Hernández y Alarcón, por ejemplo, en su libro Memorias Rebeldes contra el Olvido, también hacen mención de la joven edad en la que se sumaron las mujeres mayas protagonistas del libro que hablan so, por su incorporación en la lucha armada. El libro La razón de luchar, eh, las tres mujeres protagonistas que describen su historia también se unieron entre los 13 y 16 años de edad uh, cuando, empezaron sus actividades, cuando empezaron sus actividades contra la represión del ejército. Quiero mostrar un pequeño cuento el, de, la, de la historia de Ofelia que cuenta en este libro, ella de la aldea de Zacalá en San Martín, Gilotepec, cuenta que en su historia recopilada por Ortiz y Zamora, en este libro, en los años 80, cuando ella tenía 14 años, empezó a participar en las asambleas del CUC, más que nada motivada por su hermano de 18, el que le aconsejó que ya no eran tiempos de buscar marido. Hacía ya tiempo que vivían los, uh, los de su comunidad, durmiendo todas las noches en el bosque, desde que el ejército ocupó su aldea llevándose a todos los hombres, destruyendo las casas, alimento y animales en las incursiones conocidas como tierra arrasada. Casi un año entero vivió ella todos los días, uh, todos los, y ella y todos los de su aldea, escondiéndose en las noches en el bosque con escasa alimenta, alimentación. Cuando en 1982 su hermano fue asesinado, ella decidió incorporarse a la guerrilla. Se quitó su corte para cambiarlo por pantalones y recuerda que su madre le decía, mejor que se vaya, que se vaya con los compañeros, así, citado, así tendrás un arma y vas a aprender a defenderte. Esto se lo dijo después de que dos mujeres de su aldea fueron sorprendidas una mañana por el pelotón de soldados y después de violarlas las mataron. Con el apoyo de la madre de Ofelia, um, de su madre, Ofelia decidió a los 16 años unirse a aquellos que podían darle un arma para defenderse. Sofía, en el mismo libro, describe también que su mayor miedo era ser capturada viva, como aconteció con su prima y ser violada. Al empezar sus actividades en la ciudad de Guatemala con 13 años, sale un año más tarde escondida a México, donde se prepara para ingresar a la guerrilla. Entre las mujeres entrevistadas um, por la FAF y la Shoah, Sandra García y Yolanda Aguilar son dos mujeres ladinas que aunque de diferentes grupos sociales, una campesina, la otra de la ciudad, participaron inicialmente en pequeños actos de resistencia, más que nada por la postura 
de, y la posición de una parte de sus familias. Yolanda eh, escribe una carta de protesta a un párroco por permitir el desalojamiento de campesinos huelguistas refugiados en su iglesia. Y Sandra lleva mensajes y comida a grupos guerrilleros en la montaña. Las dos capturadas cuando tenían apenas 14 y 15 años de edad, Yolanda fue detenida al estar pegando papeles en, en las paredes y Sandra fue eh, sacada del ejército por haber viajado a una zona considerada en combate a buscar a su madre que estaba detenida. Las dos fueron torturadas y violadas y dan a entender que este fue el motivo decisivo para determinar su participación en una forma más comprometida, la resistencia guerrillera. Sandra menciona que su cuñado um, era comisionado y él se burlaba de ella. Fue así que ella, una vez segura de haber tenido un contacto con, la, um, con los compañeros, salió a pertenecer, al pertenecer a un grupo clandestino guerrillero dentro de la ciudad. Las dos habían perdido sus padres y sus hermanos antes. Si bien esta forma de resistencia armada recuerda al análisis hecho por Erickson y Stern sobre las mujeres soldados en el Congo, estudio al cual ellas concluyen que las mujeres, al contrario de verse como perpetuadoras de violencia, se identifican como protectoras contra la violencia sexual y de género, perpetuada así masivamente por los soldados, reorientando así y cuestionando roles masculinos positivos como responsables y protectores. Rosalina Tuyuki y Rigoberta Menchú, por ejemplo, escogieron formas de resistencia muy diferentes, muchas veces dadas por la circunstancia y las capacidades. Al igual que Rigoberta, Rosalina acompañó a su padre en sus viajes y en actividades organizativas para reclamar sus derechos, con lo cual aprendieron de muy jóvenes a participar y contactarse con gente, conocer lugares claves y organizaciones importantes. Esta forma de desenvolverse les dio el medio y el marco suficiente de empoderamiento en un ámbito masculino. A pesar de que esta oportunidad les abrió para Rosalina a causa de la desventaja de no poder continuar la escuela, la explicación que le dieron fue que debería dar oportunidad a sus hermanos menores varones a estudiar mejor, para que ellos mejoraran el español y así sufrieran menos cuando fueran encuartelados. Es una de las explicaciones también que nos da toda esta resistencia um, de los padres hacia la ladinación. Tenemos otro ejemplo de Juliana Tug que narra en su entrevista cómo su madre la hacía esconderse cuando pasaban los funcionarios de la escuela para no, no ser inscrita. Hasta sus hermanos mayores, hasta que sus hermanos mayores pudieron conversar a su madre para que pueda ir a la escuela algunos años. Cecilia Tug, uh, Tujut Dice que sus madres pon se ponía contenta cuando, por ejemplo, ella no contaba, eh, le contaba que no había escuela y así podía trabajar todo el día con ella. Y Diego Rivera explica también en, una de sus, en su uh, biografía que su abuelo le decía que dos años de escuela eran suficientes para que no se convirtiera en flojo. Los padres mayas veían en esta decisión una forma de resistir a las metas gubernamentales de asimilación, contemplando a las escuelas como un lugar de enajenación. Al contrario, para algunos de sus hijos, y como vemos en estos ejemplos de ambos sexos, el aprender el español, el poder expresarse apropiadamente, fue un factor decisivo para poder resistir diferentes formas de opresión. Rigoberta Menchu recalca varias veces en su biografía Testimonio la importancia que tuvo para ella aprender el español. Otros autores como Carey también remarcan la incomodidad que representa para muchas mujeres ser monolingües o analfabetas. 
El haber logrado mantener su identidad y hablar en representación de los pueblos mayas gracias al dominio del español significa para Rigoberta y para Rosalina el logro de una resistencia de, tanto de género como ética, de et, étnica. Perdón. Sin intenciones de aumentar o minimizar las otras acciones y decisiones de las mujeres que resistieron la discriminación y el genocidio, cabe mencionar que aquellas muchas que relatan cómo soportaron y aguantaron las durezas del maltrato y la determinación de protege, proteger no solo sus vidas, pero las vidas de sus seres queridos en sus comunidades. L Luvia, siendo uh, una niña de nueve años, toma la responsabilidad de la protección de su hermana de cuatro y su hermanito de dos años cuando su madre muere en el bosque donde se ocultaba aislados de todas las otras familias que no querían tenerlo cerca para no ser descubierto por el llanto de los niños. Ella logra salvar su vida y la de su hermana, pero su entre, en su entrevista remarca su determinación de estudiar y convertirse en enfermera para poder curar lo que no pudo hacer con su hermano menor. Juana Vaca, Maya Quiché, presencia la detención de su padre en un camión militar en la plaza de Nevajo un domingo de mercado cuando tenía cinco años, apenas pudiendo describir los hechos a su madre que acababa de dar a luz a su segunda hija, se levantó y fue a reclamar a su esposo al destacamento de Cobán. Esto lo hizo continuamente tratando de que lo liberaran. Fue tanta su insistencia eh, que empezaron a amenazarla a ella también. Su presencia constante hizo que entablaran una amistad con la cocinera del destacamento, la que le advirtió que había, que escuch había escuchado que estaba fichada y sería detenida aconsejándole así irse a vivir a la capital para salvar su vida. Este acto de valentía fue repetido por muchas mujeres también que con más apoyo en la ciudad luego lograron formar la acción a la organización de, vi de viudas con Abigua, la cual Rosalina Tuyuk fue, cofunda fue fundadora. Aunque el caso de, mamá, de la mamá de Juana, esta no haya logrado ni la liberación o el encuentro del cuerpo de su marido en Nevaj, fue un ejemplo de resistencia para su hija, quien luego, al regresar también a vivir a Nevaj, se encuentra hoy trabajando como coordinadora y capacitadora de diferentes grupos de mujeres contra la violencia y por los derechos humanos. Y Juana continúa empoderando a otras mujeres a pesar del intento de secuestro que tuvo, y sin dejarse intimidar por las autoridades locales, locales que han tratado de sabotear su trabajo. Quiero finalizar esta ponencia mostrándoles un pequeño momento corto de la fundación de, de Conavigua, bajo las palabras y de otra forma de resistencia que han sido las comunidades de formación de, de resistencia, en un video um, que espero que ahora técnicamente lo logremos hacer lo más rápido posible. Ese, esa organización nació desde, desde el año 1991, donde estamos bajo la montaña, ahí donde se vio la necesidad también que las mujeres, que nosotras mujeres, que nosotros, no solo los hombres, nosotros también, tenemos derecho de, de reclamar también todo nuestro... Nuestro, si hay cosas que nos hace y nos quedamos así. Bueno, quería decirles en estas dos... ¿Quiénes ¿quién es más está en, su, en esa organización? Pues ese, esa organización nació desde, 
13 del año 1991, donde estamos bajo la montaña, ahí donde se vio la necesidad también que las mujeres, que nosotras mujeres, que nosotros, no solo los hombres, nosotros también, tenemos derecho de, de reclamar también todo nuestro, nuestro, si hay cosas que nos hace y nos quedamos así, debemos de aprender que tenemos nuestro derecho. ¿Cómo se llama la organización? La organización de mujeres en resistencia, que es OMR, la llamamos. ¿Y por qué se llama así? Porque nació en la resistencia. Luego un día que nosotros que ya no, así como te dijo, que ya no hay para dónde, ya no tenemos ropa, no tenemos, no tenemos jabón. Este encuentro eh, de tres días, el 11, 12, eh, no, el 10, 11 y 12 de de septiembre del 88, que eh, fue, eh, fue la primera asamblea, lo llamamos así como primer, eh, primer asamblea nacional de las mujeres para poder eh, definir qué hacer, eh, cómo ir denunciando. Fue la primera vez que entonces eh, 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 platicamos entre nosotras y conocimos las experiencias de muchas otras mujeres eh, que era la misma situación que nos pasaba en Chimaltenango, en la ciudad y lo que pasaba también en el Quiché. Entonces fue allí donde nos pusimos de acuerdo como para crear... Eh, a la Coordinadora Nacional de Viudas de Guatemala, se eligió nuestra primera junta directiva, eh, se crearon los objetivos, dentro de los objetivos era quizá lo, lo inmediato eh, salvar nuestra vida, pero también luchar por el respeto a los derechos humanos, eh, trabajar también defendiendo a nuestros hijos para el reclutamiento militar, eh, denunciar los abusos eh, de los militares, de las patrullas civiles contra las mujeres, eh, también eh, eh, solicitar que nos apoyen económicamente para, para, para la sobrevivencia. Muchas gracias con esto. Ese, esa organización nació desde, desde el año 1900. Ahora ya no sabemos cómo es para la... Es que no... Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. That was a very interesting presentation. And uh, I guess we'll just leave it at that, right? Okay. Um, how can we... So I, I'd like to uh, open up uh, the floor for questions uh, from both conference participants and uh, speakers as well as others uh, to uh, hopefully we'll get uh, a couple of questions for both of our panelists. Uh, so I don't know, is there another microphone that's around that's yep. being, oh, you, do you have it? No. You have it. Okay, great. So that we can, uh, I can give mine as well. So we have a question here. Uh, Um, can you hear me okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the question's for Betsy, and so, but thank you both for your presentations, really excellent. Um, questions about genocide and the use of the word, and it's been a recurring theme, obviously, and not just today, but for, you know, decades. But uh, I was just, you know, you, you made this comment during a presentation in 1978 in response to the Panzos massacre that um, people started using that word almost immediately. And so I kind of wondered, as you're saying as a historian, 
um, words don't drop out of the sky. So um, I wondered if, if somebody else in Guatemala, Central America, maybe even Guatemalan Americans here in Los Angeles or the United States began sort of circulating that word. And so where did it come from? It didn't, you know, so if you could talk a little bit about that. I know maybe it's not the focus of totally of your project, but also, and then second question is, um, if genocide is used and accepted universally, I wonder what that does in terms of immigrant rights organizing here in the United States. You know, um, I think Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman use this term worthy and unworthy victims. I don't really like the word victim, but um, in terms of, of uh, just, you know, in terms of trying in the United States, since there's such a widespread anti-immigrant sentiment, as we know, as we're seeing right now, um, if genocide is used and embraced and accepted here in the United States and says, you know, what happened in Guatemala was unequivocally genocide, how does that really, what would it do maybe to kind of, you know, practically um, change the debate here? Not, I mean, not only in Guatemala, but here in the United States. Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, the, the, the sort of progression of thinking about rights and justice is very much what I've been trying to understand over time. Uh, so it culminates in 78 with the use of the word ethnocide and genocide, but it comes into being as part of a process of uh, taking ideas. I mean, it, it starts as early as sort of a, a grandfather of these movements is Antonio Popcal, um, who in 1972 started to take this word indio and put it back in, in people's faces almost as a, as a word of, just a process of reclaiming that and taking pride in it. And, and um, beginning with him in 1972 and then 73, 74, 75, writings by that sort of leader. So it's sort of a, an educated Maya activist class, right? Um, began to take on these ideas of um, long-term they started with ethnocide because they saw sort of attempts to erase um, Maya culture out of Guatemala as ethnocide, right? And so for Pocal, the process of insisting that everyone in society become Latino, which he will say, if you study that concept carefully, it's got nothing to offer us. <laughs> I mean, there's really polemical discussions about this stuff. Um, but anyway, he, he um, started this idea of, of every attempt to sort of assimilate Mayas into the population is, in fact, trying to kill Maya cultural identity, things like that. Um, so for a long time, people's understanding of that kind of attack, um, you know, Every interview, I probably talked with 120 different activists about these issues, and they always start with the conquest. Every single one. No prompting on my part, <laughs> but they start with the conquest. And so it's, it's seen, and they started writing about in 76, 77, especially after 78 and, and, and the sort of onslaught. Um, they write in terms of a very long chain of events. Um, that has the same purpose, right? And, and so they label it genocide immediately when it happens at the level of pencils. Um, but yeah, those ideas were in process for a long time, years before that. Okay. Um. Thank you. One over here and then come back to you. Yes. Hi. Um. Uh, this question is for Betsy. I enjoyed both your papers immensely, and um, uh, it's it's a very simple question. I was curious about um, the women who fled from the river when you approached, um, because uh, it involves lack of education as well as uh, rumors and, and and those kind of things. And I'm wondering whether. Uh, anyone that you are aware of or organization or individuals are helping resolve those kind of things like so they don't flee when you're offering or when someone's offering help? Has there been any change in that regard? going to um, uh, weave the answer to this so that we have more questions for our panelists 
into possibly a question or two uh, for Sandra. Uh, but I'll just quickly address what you um, asked uh, in relation to what I mentioned, which is that, as you saw with our, both of our panelists, there's lots of groups and lots of historians as well as uh, people in communities working on these kinds of uh, ways to uh, improve uh, both education and awareness and justice. Thanks very much. Um, Betsy, question for you, sorry, again. Um, going back to the first question, which really sort of, I think is an issue that we haven't spoken about, that is obviously going to undergird a lot of these debates, is the question of the use of the term and the definition of genocide, right? Um, and what I liked about your paper was that you're refusing to consign genocide to a five-year period in Guatemala between, I don't know, 78, 79, and 83, 84, but rather you're seeing it as a sort of more continuous process. And I think, clearly, that's a very, very important issue. Um, whilst, obviously, as, we, as we've heard this morning, one of the motivations behind the genocide was counterinsurgent. Clearly, people like Ben Valentino have looked at that process in other cases elsewhere. It's not the only thing, and I think it's something that's really important that you're bringing to the table. I think the genocide not only had at its heart an economic motivation, again, as we heard about this morning, but it was about nation-building. So as Tilly looks at, for example, in the case of of Europe, um, and I think two aspects attest to that. Firstly, the nature of the violence, its ritualistic, brutal nature, its dimensions, extraordinary systematic nature, um, and, the, and linked to that, you know, the question of seeking to whiten the nation, right? The, the question of whitening the nation. Um, but secondly, this question of continuity of genocide thinking that you talk about, that I think is fundamental. So I wanted to ask you, has it stopped? Has the genocide finished? Because from my perspective, and, and this is why I'll talk a bit about this tomorrow in my paper, what I think is that whilst the massacre stopped and the model villages where indoctrination was taking place stopped in around 1984, 1985, what's taken its place is economic development and structural adjustment. So I think that takes us back to the question of how do we define genocide, right? Does it need to be revamped because it's clearly inadequate for you know, these sorts of processes? Okay. Um so uh, there is, of course, a very um, specific legal use of the word genocide, which has powerful implications. It, uh, you know, so expanding the term in both directions historically uh, does not necessarily help that process. What I think it does do is acknowledge perceptions um, that are cast in this language, right? So whether or not that actually constitutes genocide is not for me to decide, but uh, I think it's interesting and important that the perception of that sort of annihilation, the, the pursuit of annihilation, is how people were feeling it, right? And so the, the gradual process of the accumulation of that sort of quote-unquote knowledge, right, sort of racial knowledge um, that, that's happening there is a historical process that I think we have to pay attention to, right? And yes, how it, how it, how it takes shape in the, the so-called, well, I like Kristen Well calls it post-peace, <laughs> because I think that's a very useful term. Um, there's this hopeful peace moment, peace process, right? And I don't feel like we're there anymore, right? And so this, this idea of post-peace, um, fraught with all sorts of other insecurities and, and conflicts, um, you know, whether that sort of onslaught continues to be felt is an open question. You know, you might embrace this idea of multiculturalism, and if that becomes a something uh, real, uh, you might see that as a counter, uh, the, you know, a counterpoint to, to genocide. But um, I don't know. I think these are open questions, and, and, and there's a legal usefulness, and there's a historical, um, uh, you know, accumulated experience that forms these ideas that I think is as important as anything. I'd like to jump in, is this one working? Yeah. Uh, for a minute and ask Sandra a question. Um, uh, one of the things that I was struck with about what you gave uh, so many wonderful examples of different women, uh, but many of them were motivated at a young age through either personal experience or having strong fathers like Rigoberta mm -hmm and others, and, um, and also their um, almost innate, they're innate but also learned uh, 
desire to protect, uh, either in a nurturing way uh, themselves or their families. And I'm wondering if in the stories of the women that you explored, if you uh, heard an awareness or consciousness of the uh, both the mobilization and the resistance of women, not only in their immediate communities, but across Guatemala, of other women who've certainly resisted, like the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, uh, mothers in Mexico, searching most recently for their Mexican children. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk about that for a minute in terms of their uh, awareness, not only of their personal motivations, but one that's connected to that of other women. Uh, yeah. I think uh, that's exactly the last uh, moment when I was talking about Conadigua is uh, that example, the one of the typical ones who go across all the uh, an, a nationwide organization of trying to bring all um, Mayans who are looking for their, um, not only for their personal, uh, if, uh, families that they are disappeared, but also for other uh, things that are done against them. For example, get going against the um, rec uh, reclutamiento, I, I, I should say that in Spanish, el reclutamiento uh, forzado militar para los jóvenes. Um, um, all these initiatives were made consciously seen that the, that was not targeting only them as, uh, as a person, but as a community, as an entire community, understood more as the Mayan community, not only their community as such where they live. So I think this understanding of what um, they have become, um, it's much larger than, than to see them. And that affects also the, the idea of how far we see the, um, this, uh, this racism and all the ideas against a group, the group is defined as largely being the indigenous mind. Is there another question for Sandra? Muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Ana María Méndez, soy guatemalteca. ¿Se escucha? Eh, primero, un agradecimiento, porque es muy importante visibilizar, eh, hacer un análisis diferenciado de lo que significó ser mujer durante la guerra. Eh, quisiera hacer primero un comentario y luego una pregunta. Eh, que todo esto no fue accidental, que a partir de que Ríos Montt toma el poder, eh, justamente cuando creo que Sofía presentaba una de las palabras de Ríos Montt, que sale en el documental de Guatemala, Epidemia en Guatemala, Ríos Mon dice, las mujeres son una cosa que al igual que el, que el dinero corrompe al hombre. Eso fue su discurso. Y tenía en su base, eh, eh, porque él era un cristiano fundamentalista, ¿no? Entonces esa era la visión de ser, de ser mujer, ¿no? Eh, entonces eh, hubo toda una persecución y un control social, moral, hacia las mujeres que se salían de su rol, ¿no? principalmente el de cuidadoras primarias. Eh, mi pregunta es si, por ejemplo, Ríos Montt creó los tribunales de foro especial, que eran cortes clandestinas, eh, que operaban con... Los jueces eran militares, eh, era una institución paralela al sistema judicial guatemalteco y muchas mujeres fueron sometidas a estos tribunales. Dentro del grupo de mujeres que tuviste la oportunidad de entrevistar o de parte de la investigación, ¿tuviste la oportunidad de hablar con alguna mujer que de alguna manera estaba ligada a algún guerrillero? Por ejemplo, mamá, esposa, o compañera o hermana. Y de, no sé si hay un, no sé, alguna experiencia que nos puedas compartir acerca de qué significó estar ligada a un guerrillero, por ejemplo. Sí, en muchas de las experiencias donde las mujeres cuentan, sus hermanos, algunos de sus familiares han, han sido, uh, se han unificado a, a, a las resistencias en guerrillas. Um, 
y, y sí, ellas mismas veían que esa es una decisión, por, por muy uh, familiar que uno tenga, pueda tener en una cierta visión uh, de dirección política, etc., la decisión de cada una de ellas ha sido muy individual. Cada una de ellas ha tomado uh, la decisión por sí misma si iba a participar de una forma um, más eh, en, alguna, en algún movimiento cívico, en un movimiento cultural um, o unirse a las guerrillas. Um, por muy um, que parezca cada... Uh, eh, el, la decisión de estas mujeres ha sido respetada también por su familia. Si ellas se han ido a, a unir a la, a, la, a la resistencia de forma armada, lo han hecho porque ellas están convencidas de eso, no porque hayan sido influenciadas. So, eso es, en los pocos entrevistas que he podido escuchar de, de mujeres que tenían, la mayor decisión de unirse a eso ha sido porque a uno de sus familiares haya sido asesinado um, o haya muerto en alguna masacre. Pero eso, es, eso ha sido muy individual de decir, me uno a la lucha armada o me uno a otra forma de lucha. Bueno, yo más que todo quería hacer como un comentario general en términos de lo que hemos escuchado también esta mañana. Uh, dándole seguimiento a lo que estaba diciendo Rodi eh, hace un momento, ¿no? asociando el genocidio con políticas económicas. Creo que un término que está quedando también fuera de la mirada y es algo para que nosotros consideremos también es el término de colonización. ¿no? Porque desde una perspectiva indígena, lo que, lo que sigue ocurriendo en Guatemala es este proceso de lo que Patrick Wolf llama eh, el colonialismo de asentamiento y la lógica de la eliminación. ¿verdad? Es decir, que el Estado, el Estado Nación guatemalteco sigue operando en base a una política de colonización interna en nuestro país, en la búsqueda de eliminar o desplazar a poblaciones indígenas de, de, de sus propios territorios a manera de explotarlos. ¿no? Entonces, yo lo que, el comentario que quería hacer básicamente es que también en esta discusión de genocidio se incluye a una reflexión a propósito del, del proceso de colonización, colonización interna o colonialismo de asentamiento. Hi, um, I'm Brigitte Sur. I used to work at the Truth Commission in Guatemala back in the 90s. And um, so I have a question specifically for you regarding, I remember when we were there, there was a lot of resistance to the idea of resistance and, and how much did the communities actually resist and, and what difference did that make in terms of the research, in terms of the law, in terms of what happened to them. Um, and I wonder if, I mean, part of it was the late 90s are different from now, but I'd like to hear from you as a historian, how has that changed now? How, what's the ethos there in terms of accepting the idea um, that whether or not there's certain kinds of resistance, it doesn't impact the, the fact that these were crimes against humanity that were committed against the communities? Thank you. Okay, right. The, um, Yeah, the, the resistance to the idea of resistance is very troubling, and I, it has been since that process, right? Um, as if being politically active somehow justifies genocide. It's an absurd, if you carry the logic, it makes no sense, right? Um, but there's an undercurrent of, of you know, um, every society who's been through this has their phrase. Uh, it must have been for something, or they were involved in, uh, you know, something that they shouldn't have been, right? Asking for it, that kind of idea. It's ridiculous, and it always has been, right? Um, but I think only now, I mean, this, this EHOS initiative is so fascinating to me, because it's the first time I've seen, in a very public way, pushing this idea very, very aggressively, um, showing how ridiculous it is to not be able to talk about resistance, And I think their tactic of at attaching it, you know, harnessing it right up to the October Revolution is brilliant. Um, these were processes that grew from each other. You know, the, the, the shutdown of that process in 1954 in no way shut it down um, in, in organizing circles. Um, and everything that happened later is remembering that moment. And so um, attaching it to that, which I think has less of a stigma attached to it, than the armed conflict, 
might get past this problem, right? Um, I'm also curious about people who study genocide elsewhere. I'm sure that this is a subject in other locations. Um, I don't know. I'd love to hear about that. Um, the just sort of notion of needing an apolitical victim is extremely troubling. I just wanted to uh, add something. Um, what we see in genocide studies is that uh, you ha uh, it doesn't make a difference for the perpetrator if uh, they uh, uh, encounter an actual enemy or an actual resistor or an imagined one. In the, ma in the ma majority of cases, it's an imagined uh, uh, resistance, what they uh, fear and uh, on what they act upon. But it can also be a me uh, kind of a mixture of, uh, of both. So it doesn't really uh, uh, depend on the people, it, does, uh, it depends on the mind of the perpetrator. We experienced that in the United States, right, during the McCarthy era. So that's a good commentary. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to thank you both for excellent papers and really interesting interesting work. I have a small answer um, to the question of the emergence of the use of the term genocidio um, post pansos. And this is coming from my particular um, research interest in student movements at San Carlos. And, um, you know, so I uh, wrote in my dissertation in my book about how um, it's interesting to me that only after pansos does this term um, come into being. And I've always assumed um, with more or less evidence to back it up, that it's about university students who are going to international student conferences since um, the early 1950s, who are influenced by a kind of um, post-World War II internationalism and very much the UN language um, of human rights to be thinking of genocidio in Guate. But I really appreciated your, your um, reminder of the emergence of the, of the word ethnocidio too, because it makes me I always want to trouble that idea that this term is coming from, say, the West, through San Carlistas, to the countryside, through the Ferg, and then to the Cook. Um, so I'm, I'm really uh, fascinated by, and I can't wait to read more about this um, kind of simultaneous genealogy of ethnocidio also. So thank you for that. Well, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, I think we might, if it's okay, have time for one more question. Um, okay. Uh. Actually, I just wanted to make a comment in relation to what you said about the Truth Commission. I was living in Guatemala at the time. And I remember it wasn't just a resistance to resistance. It was also a resistance to genocide, and it was a resistance to rape as a weapon of war. And I remember that they, I don't know if you were at that meeting, but the, the, the meeting was civil society, and there was this very interesting alliance between some of the Mayan activists and some of the feminists, which was an unusual alliance. And it was around getting onto the agenda genocide and rape. And, and it was very, and I, and I remember speaking to one of the people in the Truth Commission saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe you guys don't see it as genocide, but for Francisco Raimundo there, who buried 350 people one day, you know, and the next day in, his, in the village next to his, another 200 and something, you know, that was genocide for him, you know. So, so I, I just wanted to kind of, I really was, thought your, question, your comment was interesting, and I just wanted to add to that. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, thank uh, both of our panelists very much, uh, Sandra and Betsy, for being here, and all of the audience for your participation. Uh, we're going to break now uh, for a break, and I'll hand it over to Wolf to tell you details. So thanks uh, to the panelists, and we reconvene at 3.20. Yeah? And so we have a break now. <laughs>